Good morning. Today we'll talk about uh, Europe's relationship to Africa and vice versa. Against the backdrop of a growing interest, at least in Europe, interest in of Europe in Africa, whether it's also the case the other way around, we'll see and we'll talk about it. And in Germany at the moment, uh, there are many rhetoric uh, activities with a view to Africa. The Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation in charge of Africa and the Minister Gerd Müller is highly active, especially highly active to announce many things during the time of the German presidency in the European, in the Council of Europe, uh, uh, major plan for Africa shall be forged. Uh, that is one of the questions. Uh, at the moment, we can only speculate what it will look like, but uh, I'll talk about that with three uh, uh, highly reputed uh, participants from Kenya, Ajambo Obur, a writer, an author, who has written many uh, novels which have found a lot of interest uh, dealing with the current uh, policy matters of Africa, Kenya, the Indian Ocean, always building references to history, to the colonial history and Europe's influence. Two of her novels also were published in German. Uh, one will appear in a few weeks or months' time. The first one does in German. The German title, The Place Where the Journey Ends, uh, that was published a few years ago, it has been heavily discussed. The second novel, The Dragonfly, uh, now is published under uh, the title Das Meer der Libellen in September. Yvonne Uhr, until summer, was a fellow at the Scientific Center in Berlin in the contemplative Grunewald. Our second interlocutor is Gerd Hanke, a lawyer, translator, language scientist, highly interesting mix, as it were. And amongst his many publications, especially those are of interest in uh, this meeting here, dealing with Rwanda early on and highly intensively, uh, intensively he dealt with Rwanda, Rwanda and the genocide as a, in its wake from 1994. He published a book which, was, uh, which appeared at the beginning of the year with the title The Dilemma. This is about economic cooperation, a mix of analysis and workshop report, because Gerd Hanke himself has also been involved in some projects in Congo and in Rwanda. Hence, he offers uh, quite a quick view on Rwanda, which is still considered a model case of economic cooperation in Africa. The third one is Robert Kappel, a professor uh, who is retired but not tired. He is uh, working in Leipzig. He also dealt with the relations between Africa and Europe. For many years, Robert Kappel was the president of the GIGA, the German Institute for Global and Area Studies in Hamburg, a mix of research institute and think tank and uh, an advisory institute, hence uh, trying to build the bridge between research and political advice. Robert Kappel intervenes uh, on many media regarding issues of Africa, just, uh, economic development and German uh, development cooperation, hence a lot of competence, and we can make a head start having said this. My first question to Yvonne, if you look to Europe from Kenya, what is the, the perspective? Is there any interest at all anymore? Is Europe still a region bringing hope and promise for Africa? Or is this a region causing frustration, representing a history of disappointed hopes and expectations? If you talk to friends and colleagues, uh, other intellectuals, with a man on the street, uh, what, what is their view of Europe? Thank you, and uh, it's a privilege to share this space with all of you. Uh, in response to your question, I think it's a mixed uh, it's a mixed bag. 
uh, Europe will always be interesting because Europe is made up of human beings and human beings fascinate one another. Uh, so the, the idea of connection will, is, is, will remain. But Europe also as a, an historical idea, uh, that may be on the, how do you say it, not on the, de on, on the declining edge, only in that the new games, the new, the new players that have entered the circle, so to say. China is actually far more interesting and uh, economically, for example, you know, um, uh, China has become Africa's uh, largest trading partner. So just in terms of stuff on the, uh, on the ground, uh, souls on the ground, China is far more interesting. Uh, there are a lot more, and also what's uh, a, a, an overdue point of interest is intra-African conversations there with the establishment of the Africa continental free trade area. Uh, that becomes a priority conversation, certainly for us, both in Kenya and on the continent. Um, Europe, not as, a, as not as an organic whole, but Europe in its individual form, um, then makes its presence known uh, in interesting ways. For, before coronavirus, every single month there were delegations of various Euro individual European representatives um, uh, trotting all over our continent, coming into the continent and trying to re-establish or or re-engineer new relationships. So um, who knows what happens in the future? Uh, but since we are all members of this uh, uh, mothership Earth, um, we can't get away from one another. Um, what's going to be interesting is what type of relationships evolve, especially in the post-pandemic future. Thank you very much. Catchword of Europe's interest in Africa, and the, you've already mentioned uh, the relation to China and the Chinese commitment to parts of Africa. Well, in European capital cities and ministries, uh, this has also call, caused quite a stir. Robert, uh, what is your assessment regarding Europe's attitude to Africa in recent years? Has it changed? And we keep talking about Europe as a unit. But uh, what does Europe's attitude look like, respectively of the attitude of various uh, countries? Is there something like a European attitude? Uh, Europe has a long-standing history with the African uh, continent, colonialism, post-colonialism. There were a lot of treaties, like the Cotonou Treaty. And here, the European Union together with the African states, started cooperation relations. And, well, this cooperation has um, become paralyzed after all the institutions that have been developed and all the talks and discourses you have had lately, negotiations on all different things, intervention in the Sahel zone, economic cooperation, technological cooperation, and so forth, after all this has come into a misalignment somehow. And this is due to the fact mainly that, first of all, European interests on the continent are very different, France and Great Britain. They have totally different relations with the continent compared to Denmark or Czech Republic. I mean, there are big differences. And Germany has mainly economic relations, especially to South Africa and North Africa. So there is a lot of difference. And in a union, it's difficult to have a common stand. And the approaches of President Macron of France in order to come to a more coherent European policy towards Africa has shown results to a certain extent. Some ideas have been put on the table, but they are still characterized by this paternalism, this attitude, which means a German minister, for example, said, Africa has problems, we have got the solution. This is somehow the basic attitude that we have with respect to the African continent. And of course, a lot has to change, and I think we should to move away from this paternalism. On the other hand, as Yvonne has quite rightly pointed out from Kenya, the African continent is very diversified. Kenya might have stronger ties with with other countries, China, India, and maybe also Gulf countries, whilst Algeria or Nigeria 
is much more strongly oriented to Europe. So uh, there have been different developments in Africa, and that shows that a uniform approach from Europe to Africa is necessary, but on the other hand, we have to distinguish here and see the differences, that there are different speeds and very different interests. France, geostrategic, military, economic interests, Germany mainly, economic interests, mainly exports are interesting, and so on and so forth. And the African countries the same. They also have very different interests. We have to distinguish here. Catchword paternalism. Well, it, what we call economic cooperation has been criticized in that sense all the while. But of course, economic cooperation also has to consider the relationship between Europe and Africa. That was uh, very much in the focus and in the foreground. Well, before it w used to be called economic aid, uh, it ha was also criticized, was spurred several times, but it still exists. Good, you have just uh, written a book about it and you have described the dilemma of development aid and development cooperation. What is the great dilemma of economic development cooperation with a view to Africa and how to get out of that fix? I believe that the main dilemma is that this term cooperation suggests something which is at eye's level, which is definitely not the case. Mr. Kappel mentioned the catchword paternalism already. And this is precisely the case. It's a paternalistic attitude, which is centuries old. It comes from colonialism. It's strengthened by racist pattern, which are still virulent. And the result is that now, as before, there is a division between up and down, between rulers and those who are ruled, and those who give and those who take. And we know those who give have more power, clearly, than those who take. And over centuries, and since the beginning of development aid, for decades, it has strengthened and perpetuated, and it coins the situation in those countries that I know. It starts with a small development um, helper at the grassroots level in Africa. They live much better than in Germany. And it goes further with local employees who gain salaries that normally a university teacher wouldn't get in the same country. So this creates dependencies. And oftentimes these dependencies are strengthened because of external evaluations. These are masterpieces in um, certain rates. You know, there are problems here and there, but there's a solution. If we do this and that, it becomes better. So the history of development aid and development cooperation shows that only to a little extent it has become better, if at all, you know, I think rather dependencies have been created, and talking about dependencies, interdependencies, I mean, this really covers up a lot of injustice. We, with our imperial way of life, we keep Africa still in a situation of inferiority, being affected by climate disasters. Like last February, I was in Rwanda. There, it had horrible consequences. If that happened in our countries, and if you calculated the number of people who were killed and houses who were that were destroyed, uh, it would be 10,000, and that would be a disaster here, and everyone would panically ask, what shall we do now? In Africa, it only is worth a footnote. And this is, which I regard the direct consequence of colonialism or colonial images and feelings of superiority of white vis-a-vis -vis black, to put it that bluntly. The catchword racism with a long shadow, shirt shadow of colonialism plays a role in, in development cooperation. A debate has been triggered recently, even in Germany, uh, as a consequence of uh, what happened in the United States and the murder of George Floyd by policemen. 
A uh, subject matter which has been afloat for quite some time and uh, now it has redeveloped very strongly. Now my question to Yvonne, what about Kenya? Is that perceived uh, too? Uh, do people realize that in Europe attempts are being made at overcoming this racism, becoming aware of racism for a start, for many people doesn't even seem to exist or people are not aware of it? Or is uh, there still this strong image uh, with the experience linked to it that if you have something to do with Europeans, there is also this paternalist or racist uh, glasses which are put on, or is it more ambivalent, more complex in this relationship? Oh, uh, personally, let me talk a little bit personally, because I'm a, a reformed and repentant former development worker, and I walked out of the development field. Actually, I, I entered into a kind of personal crisis, because I, when I first went into development, I went with rose-colored lenses. I thought I was going to change the world kind of thing, uh, but walked out simply because of the hypocrisy. Um, the the and 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 uh, it was the unbear unbearable and and unbearable endurance of having to deal with that frankly mediocre people, not all of them, a lot of mediocre personalities who were parachuted into my continent uh, to provide solutions that they had absolutely no context or idea of, and the presumption that they knew simply because of whatever whatever pathology inflicted them. Um, People talk a lot about racism. I talk about it as a pathology, a kind of uh, um, a sickness, a centuries old sickness that has a cultural sickness that has not been examined properly or treated or therapeutized. We use words like racism or paternalism in order to disguise a very human problem, uh, a problem of the, mor of, the, of the soul, a problem of uh, a kind of moral, um, a moral evil that has allowed itself to take root in the human spirit and destroy uh, what could have been good about uh, uh, being human in the world. Um, so I, I prefer the kind of uh, a kind of forensic pathological look at, at a condition that has endured. And I wonder if it is possible to, to look, to do a kind of a examination of conscience and even cultural conscience to want to ask, why is it that we find ourselves in this place? Why is it that certain cultures require um, a, a delusion of supremacy in order to find meaning for themselves in the world and then to inflict that delusion upon other people. Um, I think it's necessary to make it bigger and broader and understand that this is a human, it's a human crisis. So as a Kenyan, I might look at certain parts or uh, certain parts of, of, of Europe or the part you call Europe individuals, places and individual people and say, what hurts you? Uh, what is this historical weight burden that you that haunts you and, and, and then inflicts the ghosts upon other, other, other peoples and other cultures and manifests in these terrible, terrible ways of, of murder, of genocide, of bloodletting? Um, and, and is there a way through it or, or out of it? You asked if, um, uh, what do you call it, how does Kenya perceive, uh, say, for example, um, uh, relations with, uh, uh, Europe, with Europeans. It's not necessarily the collective European. Our relationship with England is very different from, say, our relationship with, uh, with France. Uh, and France is actually a recent arrival in the, on, the, on the Kenyan scene. Um, Germany, uh, on the whole, is very interesting. Germany, Germany uh, their, their diplomatic number plates is one. And I think um, at the onset of the so-called post-colonial po uh, period, uh, German presented themselves as kind of honest brokers, people who had really had no, you know, were innocent of, of, of their associated crimes linked to the colonial um, project in the region. And in some ways has managed to kind of surf that little space of, uh, you know, we are we're sort of okay. And, and I think that's also the way we, we treat and regard um, the German space. It's, it's an almost neutral kind of space in the bigger European idea and, and, and bigger European question. Uh, again, because of what's happened in America, Black Lives Movement and a whole lot of other things, I think there, and, and in the spirit and in the, uh, if you want, in the crucible that is the pandemic, a lot of cracks have been revealed. A lot of uh, um, illusions have fallen apart. Certainly, for example, 
in a kind of schadenfreude way, uh, we smile tolerantly um, at the, the discombobulation of both Euro, Europe and America with regard to the, cri to the, uh, to the coronavirus. All the, all the narrative about superior health systems and, and structures simply fell apart in the face of a real existential crisis. So I think actually going forward, there are a lot of things that are up in the air. I don't know how that will be resolved, uh, but I suspect it will be resolved in a very different way. I think the world going forward is going to be a very, very, very different world. We'll talk about Corona a little bit later, but regarding the catchword of Germany as an honest broker, well, if we look back into history, there's the genocide of the Herero and Nama, there's a Maji Maji war and another violent scenarios. And, well, Germany is more and more confronted with its colonial past, too, of which many people thought it's far away, and that Germany now has uh, taken over the role of the honest um, broker in a convincing way, which is more and more disputed. Well, we'll come back to Corona, but another thing linked to it in this context, many people who have looked at Africa in recent years oftentimes linked to somber scenarios like the great population growth has been mentioned. Uh, one argument mentioned by Gerd Hanke uh, ha also has these ecological repercussions and consequences. But uh, pointing uh, to the demographic growth, there is the fear that the half of Africa would uh, cross the Mediterranean and uh, come to Europe. Of course, we have to distinguish in that regard. One question really is whether uh, the demographic de concern is a matter, uh, demographic development is a matter of concern without using terms of paternalism or racism. And where is uh, the correlation between demographic growth and the concept that half of the Africans might move to Europe? Robert, what is the cold view of the economist regarding this topic? Well, we still have this attitude, our bad conscience, because of our past on this continent, and make it good with development aid. Soothe it, calm it down, and then we do a bad job with our development aid. I just wanted to add that to Mr. Hankel and to Yvonne. You know, our paternalism um, is always to be felt, and there is a discussion now which is really pushed up. Um, you know... If this crisis continent, the continent of disasters and children, Africa, cannot find a solution, then millions, and one author talks about 200 million Africans will, uh, Stephen Smith said that, that will uh, start their trip to Europe. I mean, this is absolute propaganda in order to create a bad atmosphere and to protect and close up ourselves. Um, everyone at this table knows that most Africans, when they flee, when they have to flee from ecological crisis or civil wars, that they rather go to neighboring countries and only a fraction, a small fraction would go to Europe and even fewer of them would want to go to Europe because Europe has this isolation and protectionist policy and as racism is going wild and uh, Africa knows that. Everyone is talking about that. No one um, wants to um, migrate to Europe any longer. Okay, there are some because of educational possibilities, migration and immigration that belongs to the dynamics of a country, but assuming now that Africans uh, would come in big, big numbers, um, this is um, agitation, which we hear in media again and again. I think we need to change our viewpoints. Development aid doesn't play the role any longer that uh, we believed it could play. In the meantime, um, direct foreign investment portfolio investment, the remittances, the transfer of money of migrants um, 
from Europe, United States and China back to Africa are 10 times more important than the entire development aid. And I believe the dynamics on that continent is a different one as well. If we have a look at some economic data, we see poverty has gone down. Okay, in the COVID crisis, it might um, grow a bit again. And the uh, dynamics in urban centers has become much bigger. And our help, our aid doesn't play such a big role any longer. I think we have to re orient ourselves. The continent, you know, I consider it, of course, from the point of view of Europe, we have to see it totally differently, not a continent of crisis and disasters. There will be crises again and again, like we have crises in Europe and the United States as well. I think we have to understand it in its transformation process. New dynamics, new urban centers are developed with SMEs um, that uh, make sure that they can promote their own economic development and tax revenues um, have become really important in Africa, much more important than all transfers from abroad. And that points to the fact that a change has happened. And we in Europe, we don't grasp it. And I mean, uh, 36 different countries in the African continent. I was a bit longer in some in South Africa, like Liberia and Uganda. Everyone here knows about this dynamic development. And if Europe understand or understood rather that there is a new dynamics, if we could anticipate where the trip takes us, then we could move away from this model of paternalism, we know it all ideology, and we could see where are possibilities of cooperation. And I believe they are totally different from what is possible with development aid, university corporations, research corporations, corporations of companies in supply chains. Here, we could really contribute to defending European interests on the one hand, but also not permanently undermining African interests. And if I look at the plans that the European Union has put on the table lately, unfortunately, I have to say, unfortunately, they have not understood yet that Africa is different, that Africa is not all the same everywhere. The continent is 55 countries with all different languages, different dynamics. So we need to develop a totally different attitude towards African countries, governments, civil societies, political parties, institutions, what have you. And the African Union lately really has developed very clearly. <coughs> Yvonne uh, talked about the um, continental free trade areas in Africa. This is a new dynamics, which finally, eventually, we have to understand and use in Europe to develop a different attitude and not hegemony, asymmetry, and paternalism to be continued further to soothe our own conscience. I am in favor of total change. Also, in our view to Africa and migration is only an expression of how negligent, negligent we are dealing with the questions of the world. We are a world community. We have to treat things together, deal with them together, debate on them, and come to a solution together. And for African countries, African countries find their own solutions, whether we like them or not. And this is not our task to permanently say, you have to do this or that. I mean, because your institutions need to become better, you have to do business in a better, different way, this has to become better, or that has to become better, otherwise you don't get any funds any longer. Minister Müller, for example, said that of 100 countries, 20 will be deleted from the list because they don't fulfill the criteria of German opinions. You know, this is short-sighted policy. And basically, um, it doesn't allow close cooperation any longer. That's a good catchword. Gerd Hank, in his last book, also uh, controlled, uh, focused on the role of the human rights as a criterion for cooperation, which takes us to the question to know what kind of governments are those on ground? Uh, Criticising quickly, well, all of the Africans are corrupt and so forth. Of course, there are also such cases, uh, let's say, of authoritarian regimes, including uh, Rwanda under Kagame. Uh, Robert Kappel 
has drawn a very open picture with a lot of dynamism in Africa, which go into the right direction, for sure. And for that purpose, we don't need a highly German catalogue saying, well, you have to do it like this and not like that. But the issue of human rights, where to put it in that context, well, with the dynamism to be taken seriously on the one hand, but we should not ignore the fact either that the also authoritarian uh, dictatorship type uh, regimes suppressing people. In that way, I totally disagree with Mr. Kappel, saying Africans uh, would know themselves best what's right and uh, to aspire to. I think massive human rights violations affect everyone. All African states, in the majority of cases, have all signed the international instruments and are obliged to fulfill elementary human rights, and oftentimes they don't do that. And we, the North, um, we don't react. We just play the game of these corrupt, this depotism states. Why do we do that? Because of mere economic advantages and in order to prevent, and here I don't agree with Mr. Kappel either, uh, to prevent that people start their way towards Europe. At the moment, it's no problem, but we don't know how it will be in 10, 20, 30 years' time. But in this context, one example directly affecting Rwanda. When I was in Rwanda last time, a singer from Rwanda was killed, Keito Mesigo, a Tutsi in opposition to the Kagame regime. He was sentenced 10 years imprisonment with the killer argument that he was a danger for the security of the state. And after some years, he was pardoned. And then in February, he was caught um, when presumably illegally crossing the border. He was imprisoned again. And then he was visited Saturday by his family. And on Sunday, he hanged himself in his prison cell. Everyone knows, I know as well, that um, there were foul things happening. He didn't hang himself, but I assume um, his head was put into the sling. And there are quite a few organizations, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, for example, that have demanded investigations, which Rwanda has not carried out. Two weeks later, the Rwandan news agency says Germany supports Rwanda in decentralization and good governance, which is a beautiful catchword. Everything is hidden behind it or nothing, with $50 million. I ask myself, what shall a Rwandan who is able to think, who knows what has happened, what should this person think of this Rwandan German cooperation against the backdrop of this unclarified um, killing of an opposition leader? I would like to come back uh, to that, you know, as this is one of the central questions, how to deal with human rights violations. I didn't say that Africa embarks upon its own way and we should not talk about human rights violations any longer. How do you deal with that? That's the question. And if you give money for decentralization to this same government and just ignore it, this is wrong. But this is how um, the relations are. If China um, exercises extreme human rights violations, the Uyghurs, Hong Kong, what have you, they do that, then we are always silent, a press release is produced and nothing happens, nothing. It just goes on economically. In Africa, we think, okay, we could stop this process. Of course, we should talk about it. But just spelling it out, human rights violation, this is no policy yet. And therefore, in Rwanda, it's rather to have a cooperation of civil societies in um, between our counterparty organizations in Europe, like trade unions, political parties. So this is what they should underline. And they should not uh, cooperate with the Kagami government that is well known of human rights violations. 
but in the West they are regarded super stable, super successful because uh, obviously um, they, they are high health, um, um, growth rates, but they are falsified figures, especially when it comes to poverty. So you have to be careful and take a closer look. Migration, one more sentence. Of course, that's the decisive question. We don't really know what will happen in 10 years' time and whether everyone will start walking towards Europe. Maybe they'd rather go to China because there we have the golden era starting again. And in the meantime, one million Africans uh, have arrived on the Chinese continent and do business there. Um, I think we should move away from saying, um, you know, uh, that we create fear again and again. If it really was the case that more Africans came to Europe, okay, that's good also because it leads to more exchange. But um, people who have to flee because of crisis, because of civil wars, because of ecological crisis, if people then start to come to Europe, then maybe as an international community we could help them. We could make sure that these crises and disasters may be reduced and we need different concepts from what we have been doing right now. The Europeans don't have a concept, the Chinese don't have a concept, let alone the Americans, and therefore I rather trust that the Africans develop their own concepts, like they develop their um, economies and how they create jobs for youth. Youth unemployment, I mean, this is mentioned um, again and again because the young people would migrate to Europe, United States or China. Mm, the youth would prefer to stay at home and with European investment, on the average, a year, we create 140,000 jobs, but 20 million youth want to enter the labor market every year. So. Let us ask, what can we do here directly? I think it's the task of the African governments and societies, the political and economic actors. They have to make sure that they do it, and they do it already in many countries. I mean, um, don't overlook and ignore all these plan, uh, plans and activities that are there already. I think we'd rather orient towards to what is thought in Africa, in intellectual groups, and in, among experts, at the governments, in civil society. They have ideas how to develop societies further, and then we have a possibility to focus better on where we can offer help and support and where we want to defend our own interests, like stable investment or trade or uh, technological corporations. Let me ask Yvonne, please, how come? What about the young people, people with a good training and education who don't find adequate work nevertheless? Do they all want to go away? Do they want to leave? And what would be the ideas, the solutions Robert Kappel mentioned, discussed in such circles? What is being discussed in Kenya, for example, with a view to the demographic development, the options and perspectives for young people or young adults to find jobs and so forth. What kind of debate and discussion is going, up, going on there? Because we mentioned in abstract terms that there is a large number of ideas, but which ideas are we talking about? No, first of all, I, I think uh, um, uh, before I get into that, and I think my, com my commentary will, will touch on that briefly. I actually, it, I don't know if you remember in, in 2000, The Economist uh, put out uh, a cover, uh, uh, a cover, uh, uh, what do you call it, magazine, a cover on the magazine with the title Hopeless Continent with reference to Africa. Uh, that was in March. I remember that offense. I, I, will, I live with it so that I can always lift it as a, as a, an, as a hammer to hit on, on certain heads. But it was also the same year of the great Africa-China summit, which opened up the pathways of what become what what turns china into the the priority trading partner but also cultural and engagement partner for the continent the conversation i'm hearing is a conversation i i tend to encounter in europe it's as if europe lives in a parallel universe completely separate from the realities that are unfolding on the african space and i say this with kindness europe is no longer that important to us 
really it isn't. The delusion, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense of imagination among most Europeans, even those who interact here, that they, they are relevant to the, to the imagination of our own futures. They're not. Only because the imagination of us is so small compared to the Belt Road Initiative, for example, or even the Africa uh, Continental Free Trade Area vision. It's, it, it, it does not apply. It does not apply. I remember at that time, Europe was preoccupied with the mosquito nets. Um, China was talking about uh, infrastructure, roads, massive roads that connect continents and worlds and, and areas. There needs to be, I think there's a crisis both of imagination and perspective in the kind of European uh, uh, worlds. Uh, and, and I say that with complete kindness. And I think what Robert talks about, the idea of, of listening, of, of taking time to attend to actually what's unfolding on the ground, the, rea the realities, the ordinary African, the ordinary Kenyan, the ordinary Zambian is likely to encounter the Chinese road engineer, the Chinese hospital builder, the Chinese research center, um, uh, you know, director, than they are to meet uh, uh, the, the European person who is interested in um, something uh, uh, transformative and, and big and, and personal and responsible on the ground. And that's one, and th that, that's point one. In terms of the demographic dividend, what you're calling the population, uh, you you seem to have a cadre of of ghostbusters who are always seeing ghosts arriving over the over over the borders. It's not going to happen. This is the continent of uh, with, that holds 76 percent of the resources the whole world needs right now. What the uh, the, the, the conversations that are, that do not take place, the un, the undercurrent of the conversations that take place, that behind development aid, there there are massive European um, uh, mining companies that expatriate more resources out of this continent than, than, than the aid that the, the continent receives. There is a, there's an historical audit that still needs to be done. Um, uh, the, the, the resources and profits that were taken from the chartered companies that become the kind of more uh, formalized, established companies. There's a ma massive historical audit, book, audit of the books that's still, that's still pending between our, our worlds, right? Uh, the, so the, the issues are complex, the issues are deeper. The superficial narrative of development aid and the um, illusion of a kind of uh, importance, relevance in the world um, stand in the way of the conversations that actually need to take place. Regarding the, uh, the migration, um, the, the, the migration of a lot of young Africans into Europe, I, sust I say this, I'm calling them debt collectors. For the simple reason that when the African Union, and I know Germany is exempted from this particular um, blame, when the African Union informed NATO, do not bomb Libya, there is a way in which conversations can be had to resolve the crisis in Libya. Do not do it because you're going to open the breaches. They did not listen. NATO knew better. And actually, I, I must refer to that point because if, if anyone wants to point to the point where Africa, uh, most of Africa pivoted east, it was that moment where the appeals of the African Union, who had an awareness of what was on the ground, were completely disregarded. And look at the devastation in, 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 in Libya right now. And that becomes the breach through which um, young people are always going to seek adventures. And yes, there are crises of wars in certain places. And mind you, crises of wars using weapons that have been manufactured in Europe. You want to stop the crisis of wars? Stop your, stop your, close, close your arms factories. Close your, close, uh, day your arms dealers. You're talking about human rights. I'm waiting for the day that Europeans stand up and criticize America for the existence of Guantanamo Bay, which is a concentration. I'm waiting for the day in the same way, you know, in the interest of fairness, um, in the, in, in, I'm waiting for the day any single one European country stands up and asks, why is Julian Assange in prison in Britain right now? Right? Um, the crisis we also have between us is a crisis of hypocrisy. Uh -huh. and the assumption of a kind of historical past um, that was uh, predicated on a kind of a, a paternalism that excused human atrocities, right? To, 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 to feel good about the cult of murder and genocide that still, again, has not been properly dealt with between us, right? Um, the assumption that uh, we, it can be excused by uh, donating pennies and single euros 
for something that's bigger, a bigger, bigger problem that we have. The undercurrents between us are the things, the things that stand between a kind of a more human and equitable um, collaboration and relationship. I, I don't think it is fair that the world should only be seen through economic lenses. Uh, the human being is much more than the worship of the golden calf. Um, there is there's so much more uh, that can, what do you call it, uh, that belongs to the human being. That's not just through, through, how can we measure human beings by money, really? How, 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 how myopic can we be to reduce the human being's value uh, on the basis of how much money they earn or how much money they bring? Uh, um, um, and, and regarding trade and regarding the future, I can assure you that given the climate of Europe, not every, not people do not want to go there, do not necessarily want to go there. They go there now because of the imagination of Nirvana. But when they get there, it's something else entirely. We will resolve our problems. Uh, this is the ours is the most. Uh, uh, we have everything that's needed uh, that the world actually needs on this continent of ours. It's the reason we have a massive immigration of China. You're talking about uh, migration in Europe. Uh, the largest growing population segment of the African continent. Uh, with respect to the optimism that I heard from Yvonne and Mr. Kappel, uh, there are several points. You know, Africa has got the potential to develop in a great, great way. I think the potential is there. There is no doubt about that. But this doesn't happen alone. It only works with the participation of the Western world and with the participation of China. And I don't see at all. You mentioned a few um, well-meaning international actors. I don't see how this can happen without, without economic policy in the North massively changing. What African people want, those that I know, the average African intellectual and average um, African on the road, is a good life, having a good life. Life that becomes more and more similar to what we live to see in Europe as everyday experience. If this is to be the goal in Africa, and you can't say why this shouldn't be the case, then in the north there will be a lot of reservations against it. This is the one side. The second point is, if I look at the index of human development, I mean every year the development program of United Nations publishes that, then I see it among the least developed countries are, it starts with 140 and it goes up to 180, 185 of the listed countries, I think all of those states are African states. And that means that the step towards a future which we can do together with Africans and regard a future worth living, this is really, really big. And it requires a lot of renunciation and rethinking from our side, European side. And I don't see any um, beginnings of that, not in the GZ. At the European level, I see that they use catchwords in a great and grand manner. They just act as if um, by just simple naming these catchwords, it uh, was reality already. I don't believe that. I rather see first and foremost the demand of an African policy, and I mean that's economic policy mainly, because e an economy has to bring the money. Without that, it's not possible. And I see us um, being obliged to do something. Robert, in your optimism, you also pointed and put your stakes to the forces in Africa. Gerd Hanke said that if Europe doesn't change massively and uh, reduces its own role, knowing that one's own mm, property and uh, wealth is based uh, to a major extent on the poverty in Africa. I mean, for the relation between Africa and Africa is not to be seen in isolation, is also necessary. And uh, Europe also has to change uh, fundamentally, apart from rhetoric, uh, well, my African whites. friends say Europe is not our guiding principle, not our model example, neither China. 
our model example are our own interests, our own discourses, our own objectives where we want to be. Not all our governments represent that, but this is a reality that we have to live with and accept it. Europe can only play a role in relations with Africa, but not giving a model to Africans. You know, um, the same goes for the Chinese guiding principles. The discussion um, is um, intensified in Africa. Of course, they all want to have prosperity. They want to overcome poverty. They want to have a good education for their children and a safe and sound environment. I mean, this is not typical European. It's a discourse that we have had over decades all over the world. Where's our world going and what are the central questions we have to solve? And in Africa, they are solved in a different way from us. Sorry, I'm um, sorry to say I mean, what would we say in Germany if uh, Ghana's government said, your health system in Germany is so bad, um, school buildings are derelict, education doesn't work as it should work. Now, we give you one billion dollar and then you can do it. You can fix it yourselves. And for that, we give you two years time. And if you don't do it in two years time, we take the money back again and then it wouldn't work. Sorry. I mean, it's um, uh, the task for Germany itself in that example to take care. There is a political process and then we do something or don't do anything. And if we don't do anything, um, schools will be derelict and the motorways and, and what have you. I mean, we have to move away from having this image. We tell them what they have to do on the African continent. So, of course, we need human behavior, we need responsibility. But also for the entire world, we have to do something. And the most important point is that in the relations between Europe and Africa, we become equal and fair partners in trade, in investment, in tax escape, in value chains, in the questions of how do we deal with the question that people on the African continents want probably something else from us. So our possibilities are limited and we have to finally eventually understand that they're limited and then we should look at possibilities of corporations dealing with central question. That's trade, that's investments, that's technological cooperation and probably also migration, maybe it's environment and so on and so forth. And here Europe doesn't offer anything to the African states. If I look at the latest instrument of the European Union, it's called Comprehensive Strategy with Africa. Before they called it Comprehensive Strategy for Africa. Now they changed this little world with instead of for. Now let's have a look at this document. And there, billions are paid into a fund in order to implement it. Then. You know, all questions are left out that are important for cooperation, for the relations between Europe and Africa. Instead, they say digitization, we want to have more bioenergy, etc. So all these are issues that mainly affect us because we are the polluters of the world, together with US and China. In the energy transition, we have not made great progress. But now on the continent, African continent, we want to tell them, and they are most affected by the ecological crisis, we want to tell them what they have to do instead starting with our house. And the same goes for agriculture. Our Agriculture is subsidized tremendously, 1 billion US dollars every day. OECD countries pay in terms of subsidies. What African farmer can compete against such mercantilism from Europe? No one, no farmer in Africa can do that, and no state. And um, negotiations will start again in October, 
but they leave out agriculture totally. And we just say, we want energy transition, we want digitization, we want all these different subjects that are not very central, but somehow divert from the real issues. This is my criticism of Europe. And one more sentence. I hope that the African countries more strongly become more self-confident and bring in their interests, defend their interests, make them clearer. And I hope that there will be a breakthrough, not focusing more on development aid, but rather true negotiations, where you are in a process where both sides really can produce good results that satisfy them. All right, now we have heard... Um, well, we have deconstructed European the European uh, po policy, and the time is almost up. Now, my last question to Yvonne, short question only. If you had one free wish regarding European-African relations, what would be that wish? Right. Okay. Uh, first, first would be to thank Robert. Thank you for your, for, for your statement. It's very refreshing to hear that. It's not often uh, that those kind of sentiments are expressed um, uh, in, in our conversations. So my, my question, if I had one, actually, my, uh, my wish are two questions. Number one is, what exactly does Europe want from us? That's one. And the second thing is, why does Europe think it is absolutely relevant to us in our present and in our future? I, I think understanding that would actually then make uh, uh, the, 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 the matchmaking uh, process um, a little more simpler for, all, for both sides. Wonderful. That's a nice final statement. Uh, there's a lot ahead of us, still wonderful, but at least we have made mention of quite a few points. More is not possible in such a meeting, but we'll observe very closely against the backdrop of uh, the criticism voiced regarding the rhetoric, rhetoric instead of substantive uh, policy cooperation of Europe to Africa, and we'll see whether the African uh, countries claim their eyes level participation and appear in self-confidence, because only in this way something reasonable can be developed. That's also my viewpoint. But, but Europe is not a neg negligible contributor to Africa either, but they don't hold uh, uh, this place of which some European politicians believe that we still have in Europe, in Africa. Thank you very much for your uh, talk, for your insights and your opinions, and have a nice day. Tschüss. Thank you, sir. Tschüss. Tschüss. Tschüss.